So in this lecture, we're going to take a break from solving differential equations in order to talk about complex numbers. Uh, so what's our motivation for doing this? Uh, so the motivation, um, well, we hinted at this in the previous lecture. So we're trying to solve, um, let's just recall what we were doing in the previous lecture. We're trying to solve second order linear homogeneous differential equations. Um, in fact, with uh, constant coefficients. So we'll start a y prime plus b y okay. equals zero. So we're trying to solve this differential equation. And we had a nice idea um, at the end of last lecture, which was um, to guess an exponential. So we guessed a solution of the form e to the rt. And then uh, we took its derivative and a second derivative, and we're going to plug this into the differential equation and see what we end up with. And so we get r squared e to the rt plus a r e to the rt plus b e to the rt um, and uh, equals zero. And we want to, uh, okay, so we want to now cancel out this e to the rt. So that's never zero, so we can just divide by it. And we get um, r squared plus ar plus b equals zero. It's a quadratic equation. And remember we called this the uh, characteristic polynomial. And we pointed out at the end of last lecture that if this quadratic polynomial here has two real roots, we're basically done. Uh, we take e to the r1t and e to the r2t. Those are our two solutions, and they're linearly independent as long as the roots are distinct. And so we can form a general solution in a manner that we did uh, last lecture. But, uh, but the question is, what if we don't have two real roots? So what if, um, what if, for example, the roots are complex? We get two distinct roots, but what if these roots, um, we'll call them r1 and r2, are complex. So they're not real. Technically, I, sh I should say non real roots because complex numbers also include the real numbers. So a number can be complex and real at the same time. Uh, but when, I'm, when I say complex, I'm going to mean uh, not real. Um, yeah. Um, at least in, in this uh, case here. So what if the roots are complex? Well, uh, we can still use these roots to form solutions, e to the r1t and e to the r2t, but um, we don't really know what to do with those solutions because they involve complex numbers in the exponent. Um, and yeah, we don't really know how to deal with that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I also want to point out, uh, let's, let's just recall uh, the mass spring system. So the mass spring system, we had this differential equation from last time. And let's say there's no damping. So we just have an x double prime where x is the position of the, of the mass. Um, so we had this differential equation. And recall that the, um, the solutions were uh, sines and cosines. I didn't say where these, co these solutions came from. But we could check that there are solutions. Um, so, so let's just for a moment uh, try to try to use the same approach to solve this equation. So, what if we guess e to the rt? We, we don't have to repeat all of this work. We can just write down a characteristic polynomial. So here it's going to be m r squared plus k. We don't have any x double prime term equals zero. Well, what are the what are the values of r that satisfy this? Um, r is going to be so we get negative k over m is r squared. So r is the square root. I guess I should say plus or minus the square root of. Yeah, we can't forget plus or minus because we actually got two solutions from that. Um, the square root of negative k over m. That's an imaginary number. Both of those are imaginary numbers uh, because k and m are positive. So we have a negative sign in there. And um, so we get imaginary roots. Um, 
So yeah, we don't really know what to what to make of this. Um, so we have e to an imaginary power, and somehow that has something to do with sines and cosines. So there's some there's some relationship between exponentials and sines and cosines. So how do we get sines and cosines out of this? Um, it turns out we can extract sines and cosines from this uh, exponential still. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to see how to do that today. Turns out sines and cosines have a lot to do with exponentials. Um, so let's um, well, let's start from the beginning. So I'm not going to assume you've seen a whole lot of complex numbers before. Um, so let's just say what a complex number is. A uh, complex number is... Um, so it's a number of the form. So let's say it has a form. Um, uh, so, so complex numbers are often denoted by z rather than x and y. So z usually denotes a complex number. Um, so they have the form a plus bi. And a and b are real numbers. So a and b belong to the real numbers. That's what this symbol means. Um, oh, so what is i? Um, so i, you can just think of it i as a symbol, but it has a certain property. So it has the property that i squared is uh, equal to negative 1. Okay. So i is sort of like a square root of negative 1, or at least one of the square roots. Um, okay, and uh, and so let's just define two terms really quick. We're going to use these a lot. So the real part of a complex number, the real part um, of, uh, well, let's say uh, this a plus bi, what's the real part? It's, uh, it's just a. Okay, and then the imaginary part of um, a plus bi. So it's actually not going to be bi. It's just going to be uh, b. Let's see imaginary part of the complex number. It's just the coefficient of the i. Okay, so when we say imaginary part, that's still a real number. But it's just whatever this coefficient is. Um, and we denote this, uh, so real part you can denote as re, be parentheses, and imaginary part you can denote I M parentheses. So there's some some quick examples. So uh, real part of um, let's do a three plus two I. What is the real part of three plus two I? It's three. Um, how about the real part of um, negative five I? What's that going to be? Well, if we write negative 5i in this form, we have 0 plus negative 5i. So the real part is actually 0. This is what we call a pure imaginary number, negative 5i. Um, okay, and what's the imaginary part of negative 5i? Just negative 5. Not negative 5i, but negative 5. Um, okay, and we can do arithmetic with uh, complex numbers. In particular, we can add, um, subtract, you know, multiply, and uh, divide complex numbers. And this is done pretty much how you think it, it will be done. So let's, let's do an example of addition really quick. 4 plus 2i, that's one complex number. And we'll do plus uh, negative 1 plus 5i. We should think of the 4 and the 2i as unlike terms. So um, just think of the i as a symbol like x. Um, we can't combine these. And so, but we can combine the 4 and the negative 1 right, to get 3. And we can combine the 2i and the 5i to get 7i, just as if the i were a variable. Okay. Um, let's do multiplication. Multiplication is a little bit trickier, but um, it's basically the same idea. Okay, how would we multiply this, if, if i were just x, well, we multiply every term in this one by every term in this one, right? So we have 3 minus 3i 
plus 2i, and then we have minus 2i squared. Okay. And so what is minus 3i plus 2i? That's just minus i. Now what's 2i squared? Well, this is where we have to remember this property here. i squared is negative 1. So whenever we see an i squared, we replace it with negative 1. And so this actually becomes 3 plus 2, um, which is 5. So we actually end up with 5 minus i. And that's our, our answer. OK. Um, now I'd like to do an example of division, because division is actually a little bit tricky. So let's, let's just do these same complex numbers. We'll do 1 minus i divided by 3 plus 2i this time. OK. So how do you do, how do, you do division? Um, okay. Well, there's a trick here. So, 1 minus i over 3 plus 2i. The idea is to get rid of this denominator, or at least turn the denominator into a real number, not an imaginary number, or not a complex number. Okay. And the trick is, you, you, you might have seen this before, you multiply by... Um, so if I, if I have 3 minus 2i, then the imaginary terms here are going to cancel. This is called the complex conjugate of the 3 plus 2i. So you basically just replace the plus sign here with a minus sign. Now I multiply by, can't change the problem, right? So I have to multiply by the same thing over itself. And then uh, let's see why this works. So 3 squared is 9. So I have 9 plus, and then I have uh, 2i times negative 2i. Okay, so what's that? It's negative 4i squared, but that's 4. And then here's why this works so well. These two terms are just going to cancel. That's why I chose the minus sign. Right. Plus 6i minus 6i. But then we have to multiply the, the numerator out. So I'm going to try to do this uh, fairly quickly. Um, so I'm going to find what the real part is first. That's going to come from the 1 times 3, which is 3. And it's going to come from, just like we saw up here, it will come from the negative i times the negative 2i. What's negative i times negative 2i? It's 2i squared, which is minus 2. Right? So we have 3 minus 2, which is 1. Okay. And then what is my imaginary part? I have minus 3i. And I have a minus 2i, so that's a minus 5i. So we have 1 minus 5i over 13. But here's the cool thing, right? So we, we can distribute that 13. We get 1 13th minus 5 13th i. And this is, again, in this form, I, a plus bi. So this is a complex number. So if you divide two complex numbers, it turns out if you, you, you always get a complex number. And you can see that if you use this trick. Um, just staring at this, it's not obvious that we can put this in actually this form, just a plus bi. But it turns out we can. Um, so complex numbers, you can add, subtract, multiply, divide them. Um, we call that a field. So complex numbers form a field. Um, a field is basically any kind of mathematical structure where adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing work in the usual way. Um, you can't divide by zero, but that's okay. Um, here is the only number you can't divide by. Um, okay, so let's go to another page. Um, so real numbers, uh, real numbers live on a number line. Complex numbers, there's not a number line, but there's a number plane. So complex numbers live on the complex plane. So I'm going to draw a plane. Yeah, this is called the complex plane. Okay. Um, How does the complex plane work? So we have um, what we'll call the real axis. And the real axis really is just the real number line. So you have 1, 2, 3, here we have negative 1, negative 2, etc. Then I'm going to have another axis called the imaginary axis. 
And on this axis, I'm going to have i, 2i, 3i, and then down here, negative i, negative 2i, negative 3i. And so let's find what where, where we should put 3 plus 2i. So let's do 3 plus 2i. Well, its real part is 3, so we go 3 over. And its imaginary part is 2, so we go 2 up. So here's 3 plus 2i. It's located right there on the complex plane. And notice that there's only one zero in the complex numbers, right? It's, it's just a number with it's zero plus zero i. So the imaginary part and the real part are zero. And um, and a complex number is really just one number, right? It's not a pair of numbers. Like you should think of this as one number just living on this plane. Um, but you can represent it as a pair of real numbers, right? And that's and so you can actually graph it on a plane. And this is called the um, this is called the uh, so this is called the Cartesian form. This is kind of just like Cartesian coordinates. It's called the Cartesian form of the complex number. Okay, well, if there's a Cartesian form, then there's probably a polar form. So... Let's talk about the polar form of a complex number. Uh, let's look at the polar coordinates. Polar form turns out to be extremely useful for complex numbers. Um, so let's um, just draw a picture here. We'll put a complex number somewhere here. So let's call this, uh, let's call it x plus i, y. Okay, and this is just a complex plane. So here's my x, and here's my i, y. Um, well, how do we convert Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates? Draw this right triangle. And then instead of x and y, what we're going to use is we're going to use r and theta. All right. So you have r and theta. And we can convert between them. So let's say we're given r and theta for a complex number. So um, if we want to do, um, yeah, so let's say we want to go start from polar and we want to go to Cartesian. So polar to Cartesian. Well, how do we do that? X is just going to be, X is this right here. This is Y. So X is r cosine theta. And why is r sine theta? Okay, and what if we want to go the other way? So Cartesian to polar. So, so you can think about this. What if we want to find r and we know x and y? Well, it's just the Pythagorean theorem. r is square root of x squared plus y squared. And what is... Um, what is theta? So theta is actually a little more complicated. Well, the tangent of theta is y over x. So, so, so theta is the arctan of y over x. But you have to be careful with arctan. And that's because tangent, it doesn't have a global inverse function. Right? Because tangent, it has these discontinuities. Um, and so you can't take an inverse function. If we know the tangent of theta, we don't know um, what theta is necessarily. Um, so this is valid for um, for uh, theta between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, we could say. Um, but, but that's only valid for this half of the complex plane. So we, we might want to um, find the angle if we're in this half of the complex plane. And we can do that just by adding pi. So arctan of y over x uh, plus pi if theta is um, 
in this half of the plane. Um, sorry, I shouldn't put it in terms of theta. I should put it in terms of x and y, right? Because that's what we're starting with. Um, so this is actually just, um, let me erase that. So we use this formula if, um, if x is greater than zero. We use this formula if x is less than zero. Okay. Um, well, wait a second. So, so what, what is polar form actually? Um, so if we have a complex number, um, x plus i, y, well, sure. Yeah, we can write, rewrite this as r cosine theta plus i r sine theta. But this is sort of just Cartesian form, right? Because this r cosine theta is x, and this r sine theta is y. We, we still have it in the form x plus i y. Um, so there's actually something called polar form. And to introduce this, um, we have to kind of go back um, in math history to talk about Euler. Um, so Euler is one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. And uh, basically what he noticed that, you know, this function of theta, if we write it cosine theta plus I sine theta, I guess I can put the R's on there. It actually behaves like an exponential. So what he did was he defined, and I'll show you exactly how it behaves like an exponential. So he defined e to the i theta to mean cosine theta plus i sine theta, okay? And this is called Euler's formula. Um, well, why, why can we do this, right? We're not just allowed to, surely we're not just allowed to define something like this uh, without any good reason for it. Um, but there is a good reason. So all the evidence actually supports that this is true, right? That this behaves like an exponential. Um, so there's, um, so all the evidence supports this. I want to give you a few pieces of evidence. Maybe just like two pieces of evidence. Um, so I don't want to go too, uh, too far off track, but this is such an important formula. Uh, we're going to use it a lot. Um, so I want to at least try to justify this. Um, so, so for example, what if we take two of these things and multiply them together? So we do cosine theta one plus I sine theta one times cosine theta two plus I sine theta two. Well, what is that going to equal? Okay, so there'll be a real part and an imaginary part. The real part will come from this product and that product. So let's write that out. So we get cosine theta one times cosine theta two. Um, this will have an I squared in it. So that becomes minus sine theta one times sine theta two. Hopefully you're getting used to that I squared. Um, then we have the imaginary terms that will come from these cross terms. So we have I times, let's factor out the I, sine theta one times cosine theta two plus cosine theta one times sine theta two. Okay, what is this? Looks like a mess, but you might have seen these formulas before. Do you recognize this right here? This is nothing but cosine of theta one plus theta two. It's the angle sum formula for cosine. And then amazingly over here we have sine of theta one plus theta two. That's exactly the formula for angle sum for a sine. Okay, but what is this? 
if we trust, uh, like if, if we use this definition, let's see if this definition is actually consistent. Um, so cosine theta one plus theta two um, plus I sine theta one plus theta two. So we're replacing theta here with theta one plus theta two. And we get um, e to the I theta one plus theta two. But what did we start with here? This right here is e to the i theta 1. And this thing here is e to the i theta 2. So look at what we have. We have a very familiar property of exponentials. That this, cos this cosine theta plus i sine theta appears to be satisfying. And so that gives some evidence to why we might want to define this as a complex exponential. Okay. And here's, uh, so this is the first example. I'll give you one more example. And it's a differential equations class, so I want to do one that involves differential equations. Let's define f of theta to be this cosine theta plus i sine theta. So I'm just giving it a name. Well, then what's f prime of theta? Well, it's negative sine theta plus i cosine theta. But what is this? This is just, you might notice, this is i times, right? if I factor out this i, I can actually write this as cosine theta plus i sine theta. Right? Put back in the i, you get negative sine theta. Okay, so, but what is that? That's i times f, f of zero, f of theta. So um, f is a solution, this is really cool, uh, to the initial value problem. So what's our differential equation? f prime is i times f, right? So f prime is i times f. And do we have an initial condition? Well, we can, uh, we can make one. What's f of zero? Plug in zero here, you get one. F of zero is one, right? Okay, but we've seen this differential equation before. We've seen it many times, in fact. F prime equals, we haven't seen it with an imaginary constant of proportionality there, but F prime is KF. We've seen that. Uh, the solutions are E to the, well, AE to the K times our independent variable, e to the i theta. And f of zero equals one, so that, that means our constant here is going to be one. So that's pretty cool, isn't it, right? So we, that's more evidence that, yeah, this, this should be equal to this, right? Um, okay, great. Um, so, so I just wanna point out one more thing. Um, there's a special case of this formula. Um, so e to the i theta is cosine uh, theta plus i sine theta. What if we take theta to be pi? We get e to the i pi is cosine pi plus i sine pi. Okay. And this is zero and this is negative one. And you can rearrange this to have it all on the same side. E to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. And, um, and this is one of those formulas just worth staring at for a while because um, it, amazingly, it, it sort of uses five of the, the most important constants in mathematics. So you have e, you have pi. They're somehow related by this this imaginary number i, and you have one and you have zero. Um, so it's really an amazing formula, and it's a true formula, um, but this is, uh, this is consistently voted as one of the most beautiful, uh, one of the most beautiful formulas in mathematics. Um, hopefully you can see why there. Um, but yeah, it's just a special case of this Euler's formula. And we're going to 
use it a lot uh, in this class. So um, what's next? Okay. Um, so what do I actually mean by polar form? I can now tell you. The polar form of a complex number is, um, so remember we can write x plus i y as r cosine theta plus i sine theta. I sort of commented that that still looks like a Cartesian form uh, plus i uh, plus i r sine theta. Sorry, um, but cosine theta plus i sine theta by Euler's formula that's e to the i theta. So we actually call this the polar form. Okay. R e to the i theta. Let's do uh, two examples just to get practice with this series. Some examples. Um, let's try converting. Uh, let's do one plus i to polar. Polar form. And by polar form, again, I mean this. So write it as r e to the i theta. We can convert any complex number into polar form. Um, OK, how do we do that? Well, it's fairly easy. We just recall these formulas here. Um, right. So here my x is 1. What is my y? My y is also 1. Right? That's my real part, my imaginary part. Okay, so r is square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared, which is 2. And what's theta? Well, tangent of theta is 1, right? 1 over 1. So what's the arctan of, of, uh, of 1? Well, it's pi over 4. Right, so here's my polar form. It's going to look like square root of 2 times e to the i pi over 4. That's my polar form. Okay. Um, let's try to go the opposite way. So let's convert polar to Cartesian. 2e to the, let's do pi, pi i over 3. Convert this to Cartesian. Cartesian form, recall, is x plus i y. So we're just writing it in the usual x plus i y form. In other words, we have to find the real part and the imaginary part of this, this um, complex exponential here. Um, OK, well, how do we do that? Again, we just use these formulas. So x is r cosine theta. So here's my r. Well, yeah, I should tell you what my r and my theta are first, right? r is 2, theta is, so it's i theta, right? So theta is pi over 3, okay? Um, so x is 2 cosine pi over 3. So what is cosine pi over 3? Uh, I believe 1 half. So 2 times a half is 1. And y is 2 sine pi over 3. Sine pi over 3 should be um, square root of 3 over 2, I believe. 2 times that is square root of 3. So this is my x, and that's my y. So my complex number is x plus i y, like that. So here's my Cartesian form. OK. So that's how you convert between polar form and Cartesian form. And um, why are we learning about polar form? And why is it so useful? So um, polar form, um, makes, uh, it often makes computations easier. So for example, uh, to multiply, Let's take two numbers in polar form, r1 e to the i 
theta 1, r2 e to the i theta 2. And we'll multiply them together. Well, we're just multiplying a bunch of stuff here, right? So we can just multiply the r1 and the r2. And then we can multiply e to the i theta 1 times e to the i theta 2. And then using properties of exponents, right? We have i theta 1 plus theta 2. And not only does this make computations easier, but it actually gives us a, a really cool insight here. This is my new R, right? This number is again in polar form. So to get my new R, in other words, my length from the origin, I multiply the lengths. And to get my new angle, well, apparently I need to add the angles. Okay, so there's a geometric, let me draw it over here maybe. There's a geometric interpretation of multiplying comp complex numbers. So let's do, uh, let's just draw two complex numbers, polar forms, maybe I'll do this one and this one. Okay, so here's, we'll call this one R1 e to the i theta 1, R2 e to the i theta 2. And the way I multiply them geometrically, okay, so I have two angles. See, this is theta 1, and this one here is theta 2. Well, I just add theta 1 plus theta 2. Maybe I get an angle that's, yeah, it should be, so I should add this theta 1 to the theta 2. So maybe I'm going this way. Now I need to multiply together the two lengths. Okay. So this new length here is theta 1 plus theta 2, or this new angle, sorry. And this new length is r1 times r2. And so when you multiply complex numbers, you end up spinning around. You spin around the origin in a circle. You add the, you add the angles, and you multiply the lengths. Um, so that's a good way to think about, you know, what multiplication means uh, in terms of complex numbers. And, um, and so how, yeah, how, how exactly does it make, make computations easier? So, well, hopefully you already see that, but here's an example. I'd like you to try to find, to calculate this. So what is one plus I, that whole thing raised to the eighth power? Um, Maybe pause the video for a sec, uh, a few seconds, and see if you can figure out how to do this without doing too much work. Okay, so the trick is to convert to polar form. So we're going to convert one plus i into polar form because I know polar form makes multiplication easier. So how do we convert one plus i to polar form? I think we already did that actually. <laughs> that was our example here, conveniently enough. So it's square root of two e to the i times pi over four. But you'll remember that was very easy to do. Um, so we have to do that to the eight, okay? Okay, well, what is this? Square root of two to the eight, that's the same as two to the four, which is uh, 16. And so what do we have here? We have e to the i pi over four to the eight. So I multiply by eight and I get e to the two pi i but what is e to the 2 pi i? Okay. You can think about this geometrically if you'd like. You could just plug it into this formula, by the way. Right? Um, sorry, where's um, Euler's formula? You can just plug it into Euler's formula. Right? And we get 1. Um, but you can also think geometrically. So e to the 2 pi i, if we didn't have a 16, it's just my, my radius is 1. And my angle is 2 pi. Well, 2 pi is the same as 0, right? So I'm just 1 along the real axis. So it's just this is just 1, in other words. Then I have times 16, so I get 16. So that's just an example of you know, how to use polar form to your advantage. Um, Okay, uh, I want to ask answer one more question, which is, you know, we, we talked about what is e to the 
e to the i theta, what if we have a whole complex number up here? Okay. Um, so, um, so what is, let's say e to the z, where z is a plus bi. Okay. And I just want to show that we, we already have all the tools to deal with things like this. Um, things like this, I'm, I want to talk about because this will come up when we solve the differential equation. So if e to the a plus bi, let's try to write this in Cartesian form. So we want the real and the imaginary parts. Well, I'm going to use this property of exponents. This is e to the a times e to the bi. Okay. But then e to the bi is by Euler's formula cosine theta plus i sine theta. So let's just write that out. So it's cosine, in this case, b, right, plus i sine b. So I'll, I'll just distribute this e to the a. Okay. And we have a real part here. So that's our real part. Notice that this is just a real number now. And the same with that one. And that's my imaginary part. So that's how to deal with things where you have an entire complex number in the exponential. It's nothing new. Um, okay, and then the last thing we'll need for differential equations is uh, what is a complex function? So, um, so a complex, I'll call it a complex valued function. Complex valued function is a function that outputs complex numbers, okay? So what's an example of a complex valued function? Well, let's do the example that we're gonna see. So here's the, here's the particular example we're going to see a lot. It's gonna look like y of t equals e to the complex number t, okay? And the, the, the key fact about complex functions is that we can always write them as, so we can write, we can write this as um, f of t plus i g of t, where f and g, so where f and g are real valued functions. So where f and g are real valued. So they only output real numbers. So you can sort of split off the real part and the imaginary part of a complex function. So let's just do this. Um, let's do it now so we don't have to do it every time we solve a problem. So how do you split off the real and imaginary parts? Well, it's just like we saw above. So e to the a plus b i t. And the key, the key step is the use of Euler's formula again. So it's a really important formula. Um, so this is e to the a t times e to the b i t, which is e to the a t. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to apply Euler's formula here. How do I apply Euler's formula? It's e to the i theta, right? So theta must be b t. So I get cosine b t plus i sine b t. I'll distribute this e to the a t plus i sine b t. Okay. And so again, I have a real part of my complex function. And I have an imaginary part of my complex function. And just to kind of foreshadow what we're going to talk about in, in the next lecture, these are actually going to be uh, the solutions that we'll take for our differential equation. Okay, so like when we get something like this, as our guess, and we have complex, we find our polynomial, our characteristic polynomial has complex roots, we get a complex function, but the real part and the imaginary part will actually turn out to be solutions to the differential equation. Uh, we'll, we'll see that next lecture. Um, so going on for a long time, I should probably stop, um, but let's see. 
feel like I can't resist showing you one more thing. Um, so, so here's just a really cool application. This will also give us a chance to practice all the ideas we've seen so far. So um, let's evaluate an integral. This might be an integral that you've seen in your, in your integral calculus class. Um, sort of a notoriously difficult one. Uh, e to the ax, so an exponential times a trigonometric function, cosine bx dx. Okay. So we're going to evaluate this integral. Um, well, what's the usual way to do this? The usual way is to try integration by parts, and you don't really make much progress. And then you need to try integration by parts again, so you do it twice. And then you sort of end, back, end up back where you started. And then you think, well, integration by parts can't possibly work. Uh, but then if you stare at it some more, you realize actually it does work, um, and you can deduce this solution. Um, don't want to go into all the details here. Um, but there's a better way to do this integral, and that's to notice that e to the ax times cosine bx, whenever we have an exponential times a cosine, I want you to think of that as a real part, or if it's times a sine, it's an imaginary part, of a complex exponential. So this is the real part, okay? It's the real part um, of, real part of what, right? Well, it's the real part of e to the a plus b i x, just like we had up here, right? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to replace this integral with this complex function e to the a plus bi. So I'm doing a complex integral, actually, x dx. And so I'm thinking of this as just one aspect of this function. Um, like this is defined on a larger domain, and we can always, we're just sort of seeing part of it here. That's how I think of that. Um, OK, so why do we do this? Well, because exponentials are, are super easy to integrate, right? It's just e to the a plus b i x. If I have to divide by a plus b i, OK? And um, what is what is 1 over a plus b i? So let's use another idea we learned uh, earlier. How do you divide complex numbers? Well, you have to use this trick, right? If you want to rewrite it as a complex number, which we do, um, so we multiply by a minus bi. In our numerator, we just get a minus bi. What do we get in a denominator? Um, a squared and plus b squared, right? Because it's minus bi squared, so it's plus b squared. The other two terms cancel, so we just get that. Um, okay. So our integral is, uh, so yeah, this thing actually equals um, let's do it down here. Um, a minus bi over a squared plus b squared times our exponential, e to the a plus bi x. All right, so is that the answer to our original problem? Well, not quite, because this is the complex function. We were just looking at the real part here. So we have to actually take the real part of this. So the real part, the real part of this will be the answer. It'll be the answer to my original um, integral, my real integral I'm trying to do, okay? Well, let's take the real part. Um, so how do I take the real part? I basically wanna, this already looks like a good complex number, right, in Cartesian form. This is not in Cartesian form. I need to write this in Cartesian form. So let's just split off this for now. How do I write this in Cartesian form? Just like I did up here, right? So I already have the answer, actually. This is e to the ax times cosine bx plus e to the ax times sine bx. Okay. 
All right, um, now what? I need to just multiply through. I need to do that times that. Um, oh, I forgot something, didn't I? I forgot an I here. It's gotta be an I there. Don't forget that I. Okay, and remember, I'm only interested in the real part. So where's the real part going to come from? Um, so certainly I will have a, yeah, so I'll just write my one over a squared plus b squared. And then I have a times e to the ax cosine bx. And then I'm also going to get a real function from multiplying this one times that one, right? Because the i, I'll get an i squared. So we'll get a plus b times e to the ax sine bx. And then I have these two parts. They'll both have an i multiplied by them. Right, so these will both be the imaginary parts. So in other words, I'll get i times some other stuff, right? And that will come from this one and that one. Sorry, that one and that one. But I actually don't care uh, what that's going to be because I start with the real part. So this is the real part. So the answer to my integral is actually just going to be one over a squared plus b squared. Um, times a e to the a x sine b uh, sorry cosine b x plus b e to the a x sine b x. So I always thought this is just a really cool idea. Um, this just this problem doesn't have anything to do with complex numbers, but you can turn it into a problem uh, with complex numbers, and then at the end. So you're going to the complex plane to solve the problem, and then you're going back to the real numbers um, and with our solution. Um, okay, so what will we do in next lecture? Uh, we're going to solve um, we're going to solve this differential equation in the case where our roots are complex, and we have we've developed all the tools uh, today in order to do that.